there was a grandfather and a grandson that went fishing. And uh, while they were out on the lake, they'd been fishing for about an hour or so, hadn't caught anything, they'd been in some conversation. All of a sudden, the conversations turned pretty deep, and the grandson looked at the granddad, and he said, Pops, he said, uh, I think I'm going to divorce my wife. And Pop sat there for a second, and he took a sip from his Coors Light. He said, son, he said, why is that? And he said, well, he said, uh, she hadn't talked to me in two months. Granddad sat there for a second, put his beard down, started scratching his head, and took him a few seconds. He looked at him and said, son, you might want to rethink that. It's hard to find women like that. <laughs> we should always seek wisdom from those who have lived life ahead of us, right? Uh, for the next couple of weeks, again, guys, we're going to continue down this journey where we're going into the Old Testament, way back in time, and we're going to learn about some of the great heroes of the Bible. This series is entitled Lessons from the Past. Uh, these are people to learn, uh, excuse me, these are people that we need to learn about over the next few weeks that have set great examples in Scripture of how to be a strong Christian warrior. If we listen deep enough into these stories, we will be able to hear their souls and learn lessons from the past. Today being Father's Day, there are two men I want to discuss that not only set great examples of strong faith and endurance, but also set examples of how to be a great father and a strong spiritual leader of the household. These two men we're going to talk about today are Noah and Job. Uh, if you have your Bibles, guys, flip over to Genesis 6 and then put a mark in Job 1. That's where we're going to be today. We're also going to go to Hebrews, but I'll only be there for a second. So Genesis chapter 6. In Job chapter 1, we're going to start with Noah. One of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament obviously was Noah. Most of us know this story, I would think. He was an Old Testament figure given to New and Now Testament Christians to teach us how to live by faith. Noah was the perfect example of faith at work. He also, he was also obviously a godly man, Let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. Walking with God means pleasing God. You can't walk with him unless you're pleasing him. And we know from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that you cannot please God without faith. So from this verse, we know that even before Noah built the ark, he had strong faith. God wouldn't have called him to do the job if he didn't. But I want to put into context to you how strong Noah's faith was. In the beginning of Genesis chapter 6, God said that all men were evil, except for Noah, and he was sorry that he even made mankind. All men on the earth had turned against God, except for Noah. Noah was walking with God when no one else would. Now that may not be when I say that, it may not come across as strong as that was. I want you to envision right now everybody in this room, and you're the only one that believes in God. It's hard to live a life on this earth if you're the only one that believes in God, and everybody else is trying to push you a different direction. I don't think people quite catch how strong Noah's faith really was. You put yourself in Noah's shoes. Again, most people go with the crowd. They go with what's cool, right? I remember back when I was, uh, <laughs> back in like junior high, who remembers Doc Martens? Anybody remember them shoes? They're the ugliest dang shoes on the face of earth. Doc Martens. But, you know, the thing was, everybody had them, man. Everybody has some Doc Martens. So I remember, like, I wanted some Doc Martens. So, so I, you know, I, I was begging my mom. And, and back then, it was like $100 or something like that, maybe $120. That was a lot of money back then. It's still a lot of money today, by the way. Still a lot of money. But back then, that was a whole lot of money, okay? We're talking about, you know, before all this inflation that's ridiculous now. Can you even buy Dark Martins now? Does anybody know? Yes. You, you have some? Doesn't surprise me at all. Not one bit. I'm just curious, and I'm going to call you all out. How much are Dark Martins today? If they were free, I still wouldn't wear them. I'm just going to tell you that right now. But here's what I'm trying to get at. Back then when I was in junior high, everybody had to have Doc Martens and Tommy Hilfiger. Like, that was the coolest thing, man. I remember one time I had my, my Hilfiger shirt on and my Hilfiger shorts, and I had my Doc Martens on, you know, with shorts, by the way. That was terrible. Like, 
who does that. Yeah, I know, right? But that was cool. Don't hate. That was cool. That's what everybody did. See, in Moses, okay, so this is how I need you to grasp this. At the time that that was cool, Moses was the weirdo that was walking around in flip-flops and socks. He was the guy that was not with the crowd. He was the only one. He didn't care what cool was. All he cared about was pleasing his father in heaven. A lot of people called Noah crazy, but what I need you all to understand is Noah wasn't crazy. It was crazy faith. That's what that was. If your faith is not big enough to make you look crazy, guys, your faith ain't big enough at all. In this world today, that's the thing. When we put faith in God, there's a lot of people out there think we're crazy, right? There are some people that think our church is crazy. I take this as a compliment. It means we're doing a dang good job, okay? Noah, did care, excuse me, Noah didn't care about pleasing the world, and again, we shouldn't either. The only person we always need to think about pleasing is our Father in heaven. Now, I want to, now listen, we, we all know the story of Noah. I, I'm not going to go into full detail about this story, okay? We all know what Noah did. I mean, as kids, we were brought up in this. But there was one verse about Noah when I was studying for this sermon. And I was trying to find these fathers in the Bible that really slapped me in the face. And it's not even in Genesis. It's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. I want to go look at that. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. And did you understand, it never rained, ever, at that time. Can you all imagine God trying to explain to Noah that, that water's been come down? He, he ain't got no clue what's going on, right? Like, that's weird to him. Never rained before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. What I want you to look at is the very first sentence. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. Guys, I said Noah was crazy. Now here's what I need fathers in here to grab right now. You're the spiritual leader of your household. And, and some of you ladies, if there's not a husband at home, you're the spiritual leader of the household, so you grab this too. Are you willing to do what's crazy to save your family. You willing to do that? You willing to have that crazy faith to save your family? Because here's the thing, I need you all to grasp this. The world thinks we're crazy. The world thinks Christians are crazy. I mean, I can't tell how many times people come up to me and they'll say, Michael, why do you send your kids to the school that they go to? Why do you all go to church so much? Why do you pray with your kids all the time? Why do you have all these scriptures all over the wall? You know why? Because I'm crazy. That's why. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to save my family. Men, we have to step up and do that. Don't care what the world thinks. Let them think you're crazy. The crazier they think you are when it comes to God, when it comes to faith, the stronger you are as a spiritual leader of your household. Amen? I want to move on to Job. That's all I wanted to point out about Noah. Job chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Got a lot of scripture here, so I'm going to run through this. There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz, not Oz. If you think Oz, you're in a whole different story, okay? And it ain't biblical, okay? So in the land of Uz, he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. Verse 2, he had seven sons and three daughters. Verse 3, he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. These first three verses tell us what we need to know about Job. He was not only a man of God, but he had great morals. He had a large family, and he was very, very wealthy. We see here in these first three verses that Job was an extremely blessed man. And the reason why is because he was walking in God's favor you see a lot of people get jealous about people that have all these things a big family a, a lot of money you know listen i need you to understand if they're walking with god why are you jealous of that we should praise people like that you know so many times i'll see somebody and, and listen this is just our flesh right we start to get a little jealous about what people may have and so forth well the first thing that i've started to learn to do is I'm going to do a little background check on this person, see if they go to church, see if they're strong in their faith, see if they're walking with God. And if they are, I'm going to praise this. 
I'm going to praise this. But what I need you to know is, guys, when you're walking in God's favor like Job was, never apologize. Never apologize for being in God's favor and the blessings that he pours on you. Because I need you to understand something. You don't get in God's favor by accident. You get there because he put you there. You need to relish in that. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, be humble about it. But there's nothing wrong with enjoying the, the blessings of life that he puts in front of you because you're serving him at a major level. Understood? Don't apologize for that. Scholars say that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. If that is the case, we have scripture uh, here that we're fixing to read that he was, this was the first godly family and the first godly father of that family. Let's look at uh, verses 4 through 5. Job's son would take turn, or excuse me, Job's sons would take turns preparing feast in their homes, and they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, Perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular regular practice okay so again this is the first scripture that we have if job is the oldest book of the bible this is the first example of a godly family with a godly father we also learn from these two verses that job's family knew how to party in verse five it says that some of their parties would last for several days i don't know about you guys this is a family i'd like to hang out with well not now i'm 40 like this Several days, that's hard. Like, they're going to have to end it about 8.30. You know what I'm saying? But, I mean, this is a family again. Job not only was a great godly man, Job taught them how to party and have a good time. And, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? Go party, have a good time. Nothing wrong with that. Just don't get stupid. We also learn from verse 5 that Job's kids may have partied a little too hard, though, at times. Uh, because, of course, after each party, Job would pray for them and the sins that they may have committed. This is the first example that Job shows us of how to be a godly father or parent, praying for the sins of his children and his household. I don't know about y'all, I thank God that I had praying parents. Um, I have no doubt that because of the prayers of my parents, um, it kept me safe, it's who I am today. And if it wasn't for praying parents, I, I don't know where I would be and, and don't want to know where I would be right now. My question to you guys is, do y'all pray for your kids on a daily basis? On a daily basis. And here's what I need you to catch again. Notice that it says, the curse of God, and here's a job said it, it, that they may have sinned. Like, that's, that's the thing. That, that did they sin? Guys, I'm going to tell you right now. If you like me and you got kids, they, they, they always sinning, okay? They always sinning, you know? I mean, so many times, you know, when I was a kid, I'd get in trouble at school, and they'd call my dad to say, hey, can we whip your kid? My dad would be like, yeah, he did something wrong today. Just whoop him, you know? <laughs> Guys, I promise you, Satan's real. And even though we may know how to fight him fairly well, our kids don't. You need to be praying over your children daily. Men, you need to be praying over your wife daily. Before I leave the house every day, I claim protection over my children. It's something that was taught to me by my mentors and my father. Men, step up. It's very easy. And I know some of you are like, man, I ain't even thought about that. Listen, it, it takes all of 30 seconds to claim protection over your family as you walk out the door. 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds for your kids and your wife. I promise you, you do. And just that simple prayer, what that does is, I need you to understand this, what that does is it shows God that you are leaving your family in his hands. Do you think God's not going to protect your family if you offer that over to him? Claim protection over your kids, your wife, your household, dead gumming if you got pets, you know, I don't care. Pray over them. It doesn't matter. I want to show a hand. Who in here likes to go to plays? Okay, some of y'all. Okay. Man, listen, I, <laughs> I didn't care nothing about no plays, okay? As a kid, didn't care nothing about them. And, and then I got three daughters that love theater, and now I love some plays, okay? 
and get super excited to get to go, you know, except for some of them. Like, what was that, Mama Mia one? That's, that's just a girly play is what that is. They didn't warn me about that in some of these plays I went to. If the book of Job, the reason why I bring that up, you're like, what is he talking about? If the book of Job was a three or four act play, we are about to see act two. The curtains have closed on act one, and here in verse six, the curtains are opening for verse two. Let's go look at verse six and seven. One day, the members of the heavenly court, uh, excuse me, one day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Members of the heavenly court, guys, these are the ministering angels of God, okay? So what this tells us is we see from time to time God calls a meeting with his angels, and he asks for a report on what's going on in the world. And at this particular meeting, we see that Satan is also in attendance. Now, I need you to notice that God asked him, where have you been? What have you been doing, right? That's what he asked Satan. I need you all to understand God knew exactly what Satan was doing. He just wanted to hear him say it. God was playing a head game with Satan is what he was doing. Now, we know from 1 Peter 5, 8 that Satan, we know exactly what he was doing because that verse tells us that he roams the earth like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So that's what Satan was doing here. And that's what he tells God he's doing. Something else that we need to catch here uh, is even, even though Satan is a fallen creature, God still allows Satan access to him. But notice I said he allows it. You know, Satan can do nothing without the permission of God. But we need to catch that from this verse, that there are times that Satan does have access to God because God again allows it. Let's look at verses 8 through 11. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. One of Satan's names in Revelation chapter 12 is the accuser of the brethren. And that's what he's doing right here. He is accusing Job of only serving God because God has blessed him and protected him. Satan is saying to God that if you take these things away, he will surely, of course, curse you to your face. Before I move on, I want you to take note because a lot of people miss this when you hear the whole story of Job. You know, guys, this heavenly meeting, we know about it because we're reading about it. Job had no clue about it. I need you to understand that. Again, a lot of people read this story of Job and everything he went through and And they're thinking, well, why did he do it this way? Why did he do it this way? Why didn't he just understand? Guys, he don't know what's going on in heaven. This book is written after the fact. So we know what's going on, but again, keep in mind, Job does not. Now, we're going to go read verses 13 through 17. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmlands. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Verse 16. While he was still speaking, okay, so keep in mind, as soon as he's speaking, it's literally two seconds later, bam, somebody else walks in the door. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Again, while he was speaking, this is a third time, a third messenger arrives with this news. Three bands of raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. One cool thing I want to point out real quick, if y'all notice, they didn't kill the camels. Okay, the reason is back in those days, Arabic ways was however many camels you had. That was major money, major, major money. That was like stealing a bunch of Ferraris. You feel me? You're not going to burn those up. Okay, you're going to go sell those camels. just thought that was kind of cool. At this point, Job has lost all of his wealthy possessions. He's lost his oxen, his donkey, his farmland, his sheep, his shepherds, and his camels. They're all gone. Anything that has any value is now gone. 
Within a matter of minutes, Job has gone from one of the wealthiest people of that time to one of the poorest at that time. But none of that holds value to what he is about to lose next. We're going to look at verses 18 and 19. Fourth time, while he was speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Can you imagine this devastation? As a parent, can you imagine this devastation? I know some of you can. I know some of you have lost a child or have lost some children or a loved one. I thank God every day that I, I haven't had to live this yet, and I pray and claim it over my children that I won't have to. You know, I want to be the old, I want to be the first one to go. I need to be the old and gray one gone. I hate anybody, I hate to see anybody have to go through what Job's going through at this time. I've always said that I don't know what I would do if that did happen to me. And, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't want to know. And I really don't know how I would react. Um, but one of the main points I want you to catch from this story is what Job does next. Look at verse 20. We're just going to look at the first sentence. Verse 20, Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Okay. Three times, everything is taken from Job. The oxen, the sheep, the shepherds, the camels, the servants. Three times people come in and tell him that everything's gone. He did not mourn until he lost his family. Nothing else mattered to him. All that other stuff was material. He knew good and well that that was not important. He knew good and well he could make up for that. But the minute that he lost his family, he lost it. Men, when you lose something and it ain't your family, it's replaceable easily. This shows me how strong a family man Job was. This is the richest man of his time. Lost everything. You know, there was a man, and forgive me, I can't remember his name, but I read this article. It was a very wealthy guy from Germany, extremely wealthy. And before COVID, this man was worth, I believe it was a hundred and, or excuse me, I think it was, yeah, it was like $300 million, or it might have been more than that. Forgive me, I don't know. I just know this. In Germany, he was one of the top 10 richest people in Germany. Very wealthy. Had a great family. But he focused all his time on making that dollar and materialistic things. COVID hits, his business completely goes under. Completely. Lost everything. Still got his family at home, guys. But here's the problem. He loved that dollar and that business more than he loved his family. And what he forgot was, is even though he lost all this, he still had something great at home. This man went to a train track, jumped out in front of a train, killed himself. He still had his family at home. Guys, if you're a child of God, you will always put your family ahead of all that other junk just like Job did. Men, no matter how much money you make, no matter how hard you work, no matter the accomplishments that you may have, none of that matters. None of that matters when it comes to your deathbed. What matters is the family that's around you. That money ain't going to surround you on your deathbed. Those golf trophies and, and fishing trophies and bowling trophies and all that crap, that ain't going to be at your deathbed. But your children will. Focus on your family. That's what's most important. And that's what Job is teaching us right here in this moment. Even through this, Job sets an even greater example than what he did right here when we look at the rest of this verse, let's look at the rest of verse 20. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshiped. I lost my whole family, 
I don't think the first thing I could do was worship. Just be honest with y'all. I don't think I could. And I think if everybody in this room was honest, I don't think you could either. Job sets this great example of even though everything had been taken from him, Job still worshipped God. Right here, Job sets the greatest example of what a godly father or parent should be. And what that is, and I need you to grasp this, his relationship with God was more important than even his family. See, what Job taught us here was materialistic things are here, family is here, and God is here. Okay, Even though he just lost his family, he still worshipped. And how he was able to do that is because he knew he hadn't lost everything. He still had his relationship with God. And there's nothing more important. Fathers, parents, these two men have set the example of how we should be. We should be crazy enough to protect our family and save our family every way that we can. And that means getting their butt around godly people. That means teaching to them. That means loving on them. That means praying to them and praying for them and praying over them and teaching them how to pray and teaching them how to form that relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing in life. And then we need to be like Job when we realize that besides this life, there's nothing more important than our relationship with God. We always say our family is our number one ministry at this church, and it is. That is your number one ministry, but your number one relationship is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And again, that's what Job has taught us here. I know most of y'all know the story of Job, but he kept his faith. He kept strong. He had a lot of struggles through that. You know, some family coming against him, his friends coming against him. But the great thing about the story is, is that obviously he got everything back plus more. And I could go into that whole story, but I'm not. I'm trying to prove a point today about how to be a good father and be a good parent. And these two men have set that example for us. I'm going to close with this story. We have somebody from, that I know personally. And this person lost a son to murder. A lot of y'all are going to know who this is, but some of you don't. She lost a grandson to an accident just a few years later. And then less than a year ago, she lost the love of her life to an illness. This person's had a, a tough life, a hard time. But the great thing about this person, she has set an example of Job. Even though all this happens, She's never lost her faith in God. She's never put any relationship above that. And at every death, she worshiped. If you want to see the heart of Job, and that's my question to y'all today, is do you have that heart of Job where there's nothing more important than that relationship with God? And she's not here today, but when you see Mama Maya, you hug her neck and you tell her thank you for setting the example that she has. Not just for this church, but for everybody that she comes in contact with that knows she's been through a Job story. Because I'm going to tell you right now, and some of y'all know this, that have come to me for counseling. When you come to me and you start telling me you got these problems, I always say, no, I know somebody's had a lot worse. And I tell that story. It'll put you in check real quick. So the next time you come home and, you know, you, you, you lost in the stock market a little bit that day, you know. You got a flat tire. I don't know. You lost your job. I don't give a darn what it is. Anything stupid like that, it means nothing when you can come home to your family and when you can pray to the Father in heaven before you go to bed. None of that matters. You need to think about that, guys. Y'all don't, there, there's a lot of people in here, I promise you. I know, I know, don't get me wrong. I know y'all got struggles, and I know you got some problems. I get that. I do, too. But you need to think about, is it really that bad? God's prepared me for this moment. I can fight through this. Is it really that bad? 